Would you like to see an x-ray of your soul? An x-ray of your emotional infrastructure? Well, just like the body today with scans, with x-rays, with different types of technologies, we can see the inner workings of what makes us tick. We have a blueprint that will give you a picture of the spectrum of your emotions and understanding how they work and what you can do to improve them. Check out the description below. The special Omer book, 49 Steps, Personal Refinement, Character Development, Understanding and Cultivating the Very Nature of Your Emotional Being. Being the fact that me and Shane are both parents and coaches and really our, I guess, specialty, we deal with parents whose teenagers are really, really struggling, really struggling. We're talking severe situations happening. And we're both, both very busy, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because so many parents are calling us. So many parents are struggling with their kids. We're just wondering, this didn't ha this wasn't happening many, many, many years ago. This is, this is like, what's up? Like Shana, you, you worded it really well. The question I had was what, why do you think our, our generation is finding the challenging, finding it the, um, finding the challenge of raising teenagers harder than any other generation. What is it about our era that has taken such a drastic um, shift in the challenges that we're facing? What do you think the reason is? Like, and, and it could be more than one thing. Yeah, but well, let me just ask you a question. Since you weren't parents in the previous generation, why are you so convinced that your parents didn't have an equally difficult job? Why do you think it's so drastically different? What are you basing that on? So that's a great question because Danit and I were really good teenagers. So we we're really basing were. it on the way we were with our parents and how when our parents set down the rule, we just followed the rules. We did what we needed to do. And there, I do believe that there were challenges, but I, I also know that this, the type of challenges that the parents are facing today are more severe. We're talking, you know, substance abuse, to depression, suicide ideation, sometimes, God forbid, further than that, um, overdosing, um, cutting, other topics cutting that, that, that self harming. Self -harming um, so it's, I don't think that this is a new thing. I do believe that the other generations had it, but I do think it wasn't, I don't believe it was as prominent as it is now. Okay. I just was wondering what, uh, you know, your, uh, where your assumption came from. So let me say this, look, um, I'm a little older than you are, yes, a little bit. but not completely of a different generation entirely. Um, in my generation, when we were teenagers, we had the, I just want to make th some comparisons here and then we'll address directly the question. Um, we had in my class, for example, we had some real troublemakers, people who were, um, uh, had experienced dysfunctional homes and so on. And then we had really the goodies, the goody goodies. And then there were the in-betweens. Um, what I did notice in my own generation was in yeshiva, uh, even pot, marijuana, had not yet entered into the system. It was still more or less a secular thing out there. It started changing in the late 70s. So just, just want to point out a few things. So I just want to distinguish. I think teenagers have always been the same. Teenagers are going through a transition from childhood into adult life. And we all know transitions are always complex because you know, when you're a five-year-old, pretty much your parents are taking care of things. I'm not saying a five-year-old can't experience trauma, but it's not quite the same. Once you hit adolescence, puberty, your sexuality begins to develop. You know, you start becoming your own person, a separate from your class, from your family. That's when we go th all go through some form of disorientation, let's be honest, because we're adjusting to a new reality. So this is universal through all generations. Let's just make that clear, because I don't think we should just look at it, oh, today we've got, teenagers have always been a challenge, because they're literally going, they're, they're metamorphosizing from childhood into adulthood. 
And there's a lot of unknowns, you know. You have to start making decisions. You're suddenly 16, 17, and you you start thinking about things differently. You're not just part of a group. I mean, I can go through the analysis, but I just want to quickly just make sure we understand that there are many things in common with all generations. What I think is, has perhaps accelerated in our time are a few things. First of all, technology is magnified and speeds up everything, you know. So if you have a problem, you can immediately broadcast it and everyone else hears about it. In 1970, 1980, even 1990, there was no internet. So you had an issue, maybe you shared it with your friends, with your classmates, but that was it. There was no such thing as mass misery or mass trauma. Now you just go on, right? And, And there's something to be said. People, especially impressionable teenagers, start hearing, oh, you got that problem. I also have that problem. And suddenly problems become so-called unmanageable because they become so prominent. And then there's, of course, the sensationalism of it. And then there's the commercialization, people trying to take advantage. You know, let's be honest, social media for all its qualities is also exploiting us. It's exploiting our need to connect. You know, we're using it for a good purpose right now. But we all know that it can be used for purposes that are nothing to do with content and meaning. They just are taking advantage of us. They want to have our eyeballs and they want to be able to make money on us. So so all of that, one more thing I think in the psychological realm, I think what has changed, there's a lot more openness today. You know, in my time and probably your time as well, if there was a problem at home, people didn't really speak about it. No. People suffered in silence. Today, like, you know, I don't want to call it emotional diarrhea that some people call it, but it basically today... Uh, excuse me, excuse my uh, graphic example. This is a safe space. Yeah. We can say whatever we want. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't have said this when I was your teacher in high school, but no, here you we didn't. Count. You definitely okay. didn't. <laughs> right. So there's also that element of, you know, like everybody's just talking, open mic. I'm not against, by the way, breaking silence. I think it's very healthy. But there was an element of a lot more discreet, and you really you suffered in silence, which has many downsides, by the way. Many downsides. Many of our parents never expressed their emotions, which frankly has only led to more problems. But but teenagers were not really allowed to just voice things. So you so you just were basically you conformed. And today, I think there's almost a license that's been given that everybody just says what's on their mind, which on one hand is something healthy about that. On the other hand, it leads to chutzpah, it leads to being obnoxious, it leads to my way, you know. And finally, I think one more thing that needs to be pointed out is we're successful, we're prosperous, we're comfortable. And comfort always leads to a certain element of sense of entitlement and a sense of apathy even. You know, um, when my parents came to the United States, they were immigrants. They didn't know the language. They had no money. Their struggle was to survive. And their values were very crystallized. But once you get comfortable, there's there's a concept of, you know, I'm comfortable. There's no sense of urgency. You stop appreciating values. I assure you, ask a teenager today, tell me your top three values. They're going to be very different than what a teenager would have said 30 years ago. It probably will not include family love. It'll probably include entertainment, my friends, maybe sexuality and those in that world. It's far more materialistic because we are not struggling to survive. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, real existential survival. And, And sadly the blessing of prosperity and comfort often brings a certain numbness to what really matters. I, never I see this because I, I counsel a lot of people who are dating and their priorities. I want a guy with a lot of money. I want to be comfortable. I want a lot of vacations. And I say, does it matter that he's kind? Does it matter that he's trustworthy? Or for that matter, a woman, do you mind? And it's, it doesn't always come to the top of the list. It's more important that I be comfortable than have someone I trust. I mean, we all understand what that means. So there's a certain shallowness and superficiality to all of it. And finally, I'll say the media helps dumb us down. Let's be honest. You know, the TikToks and so on, with all its advantage, and I use technology for good purposes, hopefully, but it also creates a very low common denominator of titillation and sensationalism mm-hmm. and, and the voyeurism. And you know, what, what, what more things are more outrageous, get more hits, you know. I think that's part of the combination. And all of that, unfortunately, who is going to be most victim to all of it? 
impressionable teenagers who don't yet have the grounding and the maturity to deal with all this emotional, um, I would say, uh, this emotional overload. Right. That makes a lot of so sense. So now what? What do we do now? So now what? As parents today, as parents today, you know, um, some of some of the clients that I'm, or some of the, the the cases that I'm facing, some of them are minor, some of them are pretty major. So, what now? How do we how do we navigate this? Because I do think there has to be some type of balance to everything you're saying. And how do how do parents implement the balance of being able to voice what we're feeling and saying, but also to not be disrespectful while we're doing it? Right. So I think let's begin with parents before we get to coaches and therapists and professionals. Parents can do tremendous because let's be honest, everything begins at home. Every child's early impressions will begin from their parents from not only uh, from birth but also in pregnancy at the end of the day every child on earth was once in their mother's womb and its first experiences emotional experiences in life are all about the parents so long before we're even conscious and aware the way children are nurtured or not nurtured is going to impact them for life so i would say due to these new challenges of our times where everything is accelerated and everything is amplified and everything is out there, I think the, the, maybe this sounds like a cliche, the idea of expressing love to your child, unconditional love, expressing to your child that you are extremely valuable, you're indispensable, that you matter, that you matter. You matter to me, to God, to the human race is more important than ever because as they grow older, they're actually being told that they don't matter that much. They're a statistic, they don't. So who's gonna give them that sense of fundamental value? So today, if you criticize your child or you validate them, I think the effect is far worse than it was once when we lived in more insulated environment. So it's critical that parents really are conscientious and very deliberately express, literally on a daily basis, you're my child, I'm always there for you. Never, ne always know that. And even when you're a little critical, make sure they understand that it's coming from a loving place. Don't assume. Even if you're extremely busy and you have two careers, meaning father and mother, make time for your children. This is the most precious commodity. Remember, an ignored child, it's not a small matter. For a child being ignored, the child feels abandoned. And it undermines their security. It undermines their confidence. And all these things become magnified when they get older. So I would say we have to work overtime more than ever before to express that importance. Technology is just a tool. The key thing that children need to know is that you have a soul, you have an ashama, I love you. God sent you to this world. You know, I'll just share with you, I think just a, a practical, a few years ago, a woman wrote to me right before Rosh Hashanah, she said, the new year is coming. And I listen to a lot of your programs. I see you talk a lot about parents and children. What would you suggest a new thing I can do to help my children? And I thought about it. And then I wrote up a short uh, exercise, which I can't tell you how many comments I received from parents. And they, were, they did it. And it said it changed literally their homes. I said, very simple. Every morning and every evening, before your children go to sleep and as when they wake up, don't just say, I love you, pack up their lunch and send them off to school. Add one more thing. When you say Moda'ani with them, tell them, you know, God sent you mo your, my most precious gift to fulfill a very unique mission in this world that you and only you can fulfill. I am here to help you live up to your great potential. Hmm. Your neshama. You have to always know your soul is the most precious thing. It's God saying you matter. Birth is God saying you matter and that you're most valuable. That's all. Say it in the morning and the evening in a very sincere way, the children will begin to hear it and you'll see conversations. What's a neshama? What's purpose? What's meaning? You know, the best defense is offense. You can't just shut off technology. You can't close down the world. You can't slow it down. But you can arm your children with more resources and the arsenal of inner confidence that comes from your neshama. So really, it comes down to nourish and nurture the souls of your children the more you do so in the younger age, the, the rewards and the fruits of your labor will be unbelievable as they grow older. Oh. 
no guarantee there's no guarantees life is full of challenges but you want to arm your children with as much of that validation and and value that they should know that they're not defined by their friends they're not defined by technology they're not defined by advertising they're defined by god's soul and within them and their purpose in life i have more to say on this i don't want to Want to Please keep, go. keep going. We're, uh, the, yeah, we have is... more and more people joining as we're okay, speaking. Okay, so then so I'll say this. Keep going. As your children grow older, identify their strengths. If a child is musical, make sure they actualize that. Then it Don't is so good them. with that. Then it is such. She's so good yeah. with that. Yeah. If they like to read, suggest books. Give them to read. Don't ever suppress their talents. Even if you think they can get into trouble, they listen to the wrong music, they read the wrong book. So fine, so direct and guide them. But never, remember, when you stop someone from fulfilling their, actualizing their talent, it can come back to be to bite big time. Because it's like telling somebody not to use their right arm or their left arm. What mm. do you mean? That's, that's who I am. So identifying your children, their skills, their talents. Some students, some children will be good students. Some are just not, they don't have the attention span. Obviously, I'm not suggesting letting everyone do whatever they want, but really adjusting yourself. Like we say, <laughs> educate your child according to their way. Why doesn't it say according to the Torah way, according to God's way? Because God is saying, take my way and, and accommodate and customize it and tailor it to your children. And children are different. The, that besides the fact that you help them actualize, you, they also you respect them for who they are. So as they grow older, they don't feel, oh, I did this because I really wanted to do something else, but my parents were not approving. So cultivate, cultivate their strengths. And again, whenever I see teenagers in trouble, and I deal a lot with teenage teens at risk, they got stuck, they got in trouble with drugs, with alcohol, with uh, with other all kinds of stuff that is not healthy. So, yes, you have to do everything possible to get them out of there, but the best defense is offense. Mm. You find something they like. Remember, find a healthy passion weakens the passion for the unhealthy. Remember, oh. remember, every addiction is a form of attachment. It's just what's called attachment disorder. They're attached to the wrong thing. So they, they think they can get relief and, um, and, uh, and, and, and feel a little instant gratification from something that's not healthy. Like a thirsty person is going to drink whatever that you give them, even if it's toxic. The solution is not to tell them don't drink. Give them a healthy drink. Find a passion that they have. As I said, again, a talent, a skill, and incentivize them in that area. Because at the end of the day, the best way to, to wean somebody off, to, uh, to wean somebody off an unhealthy passion is to give them a healthy passion. You need alternatives. You have to rechannel. Not repress, rechannel, redirect. I mean, again, I can go on and on, but I'll, I'll say some more things as we go. I just, uh, I, you know, let me catch my breath. How, let me I catch love my how breath. Practical. <laughs> it's so practical. This advice that you're giving. You're not giving these esoteric, deep concepts that we have to internalize and think about. It's like if your kid is musical, get the music lesson. Get get a, have instruments in your house if they're artistic. Have art supplies in the house. Get them art lessons. These are such easy, pr simple, practical tips that anyone can do. Any single parent can but, do this. Any age, child. Right. But it also means that you need to know your child. You need to get to know your child. Talk to, like, to talk to your child to see maybe they want to be doing gymnastics on Sundays or maybe it's it's dancing or whatever it is but getting to know your child I think is also so important it's not just knowing what skill they have but knowing what they want to be working on as well and unfortunately listen let's be honest parents are very overwhelmed by work and by other responsibilities and sometimes they just don't have the energy to pay attention to their children and you have to realize what your priorities are you know I, I've heard parents tell me I'm so busy building secure, a secure nest egg for my children, I don't have time for them. I said, do you hear the paradox in your words? You're trying to give them security by making them insecure, you know? Right, right. <laughs> but, but it goes um, back to the same thing you said earlier of what's the priority? Yeah. What and is I'll, the priority? And I'll say, you know, and just to bring, since we are also coming from a, we come from the Jewish tradition, um, Judaism is often for many, many children becomes a, a burden. 
Shabbos, oh boy, Shabbos. You know, I can't do this. I can't text. I can't do that. I can't Let's do this. Let's go there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, want, I want to just add something in that. Make Shabbos, Yom Tov, Pesach exciting. Don't do it by rote. You know, children, the worst thing they need is to come to a Shabbos table and it's every week the same thing. Father falls asleep the same place. They sing the same songs, same food. I don't mean the exact same food. I mean the same recipes. You know, it becomes, and children cannot stand boredom and monotony. You have to create, make a Shabbos into a, uh, if you want, turn it into a creative project. Yep. You know, turn it into something that they, Tell, let them tell a story, sing a song, paint something. The Seder is coming. I can tell you so many children, yes, we know we excite them with the, 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 the fear cautious, asking the questions, but do whatever you can to get them to initiate. Get them to initiate, not just follow the rules. Let them do things that they really feel. Well, you know what? It should be memorable. The last thing you want is children growing into adults that say, Shabbos was the most boring day in my life. You know, Shabbos was the day we did nothing. Yeah. And, and, and Yiddishkeit is filled with rich tradition. You just have to pay attention. Unfortunately, there's a concept of mechanical Judaism. Mm. You know, we just go by rote, go through the motions. Okay, time to light candles. Everybody, where are you? Let's light Shabbos candles. You know, and it, it becomes a, this mechanical thing. And I, I find that that ultimately wears everybody down. And you can't imagine. And you need, it has to be filled with vitality. At the end of the day, children see parents that are excited about something, it excites them. And that just did another thing that I would just throw into the whole uh, equation here. No, no I, I totally we were relate just to talking you're about that. We were just now. talking about uh, benching licht and how how the homes that we grew up in was always so stressful around the candle lighting time, around the time frame and getting it on time and 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 not even knowing like unknowingly passing that stress on to our children because that was what we had of like the stress around benching lift on time. Why does it have to be a stress? Why? Exactly. It should be the most beautiful moment where you tell your daughter, listen, we're going to stand now with Hashem. You, close, you cover your eyes. You could ask for anything you want and need. The most serene moment in the whole week. And it's, it's you and God. The holiest, you are ushering the Holy Shabbos into this world. It's again, it's, it's really about not so complex. It's about paying attention and being conscientious and deliberate, not just relying, oh, okay, mechanical, robotic, and so on. That's a big part of it. You know, we adults have become very robotic in many ways. You know, we go through the motions by rote, and children, it, it's, it's, I don't want to call it a cancer, but for children, it's anathema, uh, things that are, mecha that are mechanical and robotic like that, you know? Yeah. Right, right. No, I, I almost feel like it's like, we are a generation of parents that we really need to step it up. Like we can no longer, like maybe when we were kids, that mechanical Judaism just kind of worked somewhat. But nowadays it doesn't. Our kids won't accept it. It, it, it just doesn't work anymore. So we really have to do the work to make it, to, to, love, to fall in love with it again. We need to, right? It, it was it, it never worked well. The only thing then there were no alternatives, so you're stuck. Right. You know, you're stuck living in a shtetl. But today right. there's plenty of uh, entertainment alternatives. You just change the channel and you move elsewhere. I can tell you. I remember a mother calling me distraught that her son, seventeen year old, seventeen year old boy, doesn't want to come to the Shabbos table. He stays in his room, and that's that. He says, "I don't know what he's doing. He's probably on the computer." You know, who knows? I don't know what he's doing. And, um, and what can I do? Um, and I said to her, well, what does your table look like? And of course, a mechanical table. I said, why would a 17-year-old looking for action be interested in sitting around at your table when it's so boring? So I said, Lighten what do you suggest? Up. What do you suggest? I said, what does your f husband do? He works in, the, in Manhattan in a computer place. I said, does he have coworkers? Yeah. Are there any atheists among them? Yes. Why don't you invite a few atheists to the table and have an argument about God? I assure you, once your son sees some action going on and some controversy <laughs> and something provocative, it'll make oh. a major difference. You think you have to think creatively. See, you know, because we take for granted, oh, Shabbos is so beautiful. Why does my son appreciate Shabbos? When in truth, what's going on is you need to make things come alive. And this is not a new concept. 
You know, there's a reason it says in the Torah the word Hayyim. Why does it say Biyadaita Hayyim? Atem Nitzav Hayyim today. What? When is today? So Rashi says today is telling us that the Torah should always be like new, like today, not like something from yesterday, not old hat. You know that it should always be new vitality. Every time you say Shema, every time you keep Shabbat, every time you do a Seder, it should be like you never did it before. That's how exciting it should be. Look, look at people going to a rock concert. What do you think? They're not getting anything by rote. They go there because they see, it may be the same song, but it's played a new way. It's exciting. You have to learn from these things. And um, I can't, can't emphasize it enough. Wow. Big responsibility, everybody. I also, yeah, I, I also like to feel like I, um, like I feel like as a, as a, as a, a family to lighten things up a little bit. Not everything has to be so serious all the time. Have fun with it. Or just, you know, play a game at the Shabbos table. Why can't we play a game? Why not? Absol play absolutely. A game. absolutely. If that's going to keep your child at the Shabbos table, play a game. It doesn't have to be anything too drastic, but just something light. Lighten up the mood. Lighten it up and make sure that they have only pleasant memories and not like go away. Oh, you know... It was just something we just did and so on. Yes, they should always be pleasant, uplifting, empowering. I mean, this is... Uh, so these are some of the things. Obviously, I should add, we understand that even if you do everything right, there's still challenges out there. So I would just add another thing. I think parents have to have an extra additional ear, sensitive ear. Listen to your children. I don't just mean listen to what they say. Listen to what they don't say. Mm. In other words, Ooh. if you see a mood change in your child, I'm not saying become paranoia and jump on everything, but be very, very sensitive because things happen. You know, something happens in school. It could be bullying. It could be something else. It could be worse, some form of abuse. And children do not talk. They will not talk to parents. As much as you tell them, talk to me. You could always talk to me. I won't judge you. I won't criticize you. Children have this block. I mean, I think back. What I have told my parents if something happened, no, I wouldn't. It's the last people I would tell my parents. So I think it's important to watch out. And 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 when you do, this doesn't mean come on strong if you think something happened. Or it's, you have to find the right sensitive way to be able to them to trust you. And I'm not trying to just paint, just address now, you know, the the horror stories of abuse and hurt and violation and so on. But I'm just talking in general, children are sensitive and teenagers as well as well and it's important to keep your eyes and ears open and 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 make maintain relationships you know a lot of parents feel they that their their teenagers grow out of them we can't talk anymore you know why not you were a teenager once why do you have to talk like a parent to a child why don't you talk like a friend oh. i'm not saying obviously you're always a parent hey. but why not just talk to them like about your life and your challenges why does it have to be purely they see you as the authority and that's that? Why shouldn't they see you as a human being, especially as your children grow older? And I know a lot of parents say, I don't know what to talk to my children about anymore. You know, because the answer is just be natural. And it doesn't have to only be about the rules of the home or just about things. Some things like you said, fun, share a joke, share uh, something you read. My mother, when I was a teenager, I was a voracious reader. I loved to read. And I read everything. Trust me, something's appropriate, something's not so appropriate. Um, <laughs> philosophical stuff, stuff outside of the Jewish faith. I don't want to go through all the we details, won't, but... Don't tell anyone between <laughs> us and everyone else. Absolutely. <laughs> but I love to read, and, and that's who I was. I just like reading. I remember once, a whole Shabbos, I ended up just lying in bed reading The Count of Monte Cristo from Alexander Dumas. And my mother said, go to shul, go to shul, go to shul. Yeah, whatever. I kept on pushing it off. By the time she, she realized it was Shabbos was over. And I finished the whole book. It's a very exciting book. And My son's my mother reading did... it, by the way. Hmm? My son's, that's cute. son's in the middle of reading it. That's wow, yeah, okay. he came on. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's cute. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's about vengeance. It's about vengeance. And, and it's a very, you know, it's, and um, my mother did something very wise. She After that, she began to, suggest books for me to read oh, um man. she i remember the two books she suggested i can tell you till today we been talking enough over 50 years ago let's hear um she she <laughs> one book was called the way of all flesh and i remember my mother telling me 
after you read this book, you're going to hate your parents. So I said, how do you know? She says, because I started hating my parents when I read the book. <laughs> because it's about, it's a book about overbearing religious parents. It's not a Jewish book. It's about over, oh, wow. over, over, overbearing Christian religious parents that the mother was so uh, fanatical, so extreme. She literally destroyed her children's lives oh, wow. until her son finally grew up. And then he obviously rejected everything. Very good book about how parents can, can, can hurt their children. So imagine my mother is giving me a book to tell me about how parents can hurt their children. I, wow. Now I realize how manipulative that was. You know, <laughs> she was like, uh, anyway, that was one book. The second book was called Vanity Fair, not the magazine. Okay. It's, a, it's a classic book by William Makepeace Thackeray. Excellent book, by the way. A book, it's, it's like social philosophy, but through like a loose narrative of a story. It is very. It was very, very. And I know at that time, time I remember Le Mizrab I read and a few others. My point is that if you see your child doing something like that, I like I mentioned before, it's not obviously you want to make sure they don't get end up reading things that are really destructive or really in it, really bad. But if you see a, a, a book, may not be kedusha. Let's put it this way: it's not Tanya, and it's not Torah. However, it has themes. You know, some of these classics have powerful themes, the theme of vengeance, the theme of, like, Le Rab, the theme of misery and poverty and destiny, um, you know, books like that. And there's nothing wrong with, with turning the book into a discussion about a human interest topic. Because that shows also, it's not about ingratiating yourself to your children, but they see you're normal. You're not just this crazy, uh, uh, like, author authoritative person. Right. Now, if there's something really problematic that they're watching, you know, on their phones or so on. So that's another discussion which we can talk about. But I, I, I was and I was talking about things a little more neutral, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Because each case is different. And I feel like each parent has to know their child. And if there's something that they're concerned about, that's where they have professionals involved or parenting coaches, which I think nowadays is something that's way more socially acceptable. And people don't have to to um to people don't have to make those decisions alone. They can get advice from other people who've been there and done that and see what, you know, what works best for their child. Absolutely. And absolutely. And you want to, again, harness and channel your child's energy into, into positive places. That's the key. Yeah. Um, uh, also, let's be honest. Uh, teen, teen years are like, I, I look at it sometimes like a minefield because it's, um, that transition stage they're not yet fully adults and you really have to get through it like you know get through it and uh, hopefully they can have a good landing <laughs> you know um so it's like a holding pattern at times <laughs> but you want to make sure that's, that's a lot of work on us as parents to keep ourselves regulated to not overreact to things that our kids do because so much of our reaction to what they do makes it has such a huge effect and, and, on their development and I can't overstate the case for getting your children to initiate things. If a child writes an essay or can create a piece of art or music and they, it's their creation, you can't imagine the pride and the confidence that that builds. You know, that's why I'm a big believer in contests and incentivized, you know, um, uh, uh, competitions. Not, you know, in a way where you really get the best talent. Like I know in camp, when we were in camp, we had color war. So, you know, the, I, I, my first thing I ever wrote, today I'm a writer, I wrote was a Color War song, a theme song. Oh, wow. And I didn't even know if I could write. The guy that was supposed to write the song, and we were in Detroit in camp, Ghani Sral. The guy who was supposed to write the song suddenly ended up in the infirmary with high fever. The, the, the captain of the team comes to me. He says, isn't your father a writer? My father was a journalist. He's, I said, yeah. He says, so you, you're going to write the song. I said, well, just because my father's a writer doesn't mean I can write songs. He says, yeah, you're going to write it, and I need it in two hours. So I was forced. I sat down under a tree. I was humming a song to myself, and I wrote up uh, some lyrics. I still remember it. I'm a little embarrassed today based on the, you know, the, the, the childish. But our team was called Ben Odom Lemokin. There were two teams. Ben Odom Do you want to say it instead of singing? Do you want to say it to us? Do you want to sing it? I, if, you, if you want, I can sing as well. Please do. Could you sing it? Yeah, please do. I, I, I know. Let's go. You want to hear it. <laughs> 
This is embarrassing. I, I, you're putting me on the spot. I, I feel stage fright. I never have an issue with this. <laughs> There's nobody watching. Don't worry. We'll clap along. I know, I know. I know. Only if you want. It's just, it sounds very anyway, intriguing. The very wait, first thing I, you ever I, wrote. Uh, okay, I'll, I, I don't even remember all the lyrics. I'll just sing whatever I remember. Okay. okay um, but it was about Ben Odom Le Mokem. So I wrote a song about prayer. Well, you know, a person sitting in the middle of a forest and just speaking to God. So it went like this. Um, midst forests of green, beauty serene, echoes of silence, reverberating in the scene, was twas tranquil and clear, birds perched in fear, silence, uh, I think how strange was the silence appeared. And then I go on and speak about, I don't remember the next section, but I remember that there was a fellow sitting on a stone, sitting on a stone and then goes, someone sitting on a stone and then i search i yearn and i hope that became like that i mean i again i don't remember it all how old it were you have gone, it should have gone viral if there was instagram you would have been viral wait how old i see you? all the hearts are popping up i guess they want me to continue singing <laughs> they want to hear you sing yes how old i love singing by the way i love singing um i just i would i i once recreated the the lyric the point i want to make let me get back to my point okay, okay. that was poetry that was very poetic that was very yeah, that, was. that was beautiful okay and then yeah. i wrote toward a meaningful life years later okay <laughs> we now know where it all started from and, but Summer it camp. was started from camp little kids i mean whatever i was how old was i 15 16 i don't remember and the the, the need to do it and I see, and, and, and you know, I look back, it, it, I ended up creating something. I don't know what, it doesn't matter how good it was. The point is, don't underestimate getting your children to initiate something, tremendous. It, it's the greatest confidence builder. And, and I mean, that's why in school you have projects, you have, yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I love how you remember that. That's amazing. It's quite amazing. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you remember the rest of it, you could always come back on another time and perform it. <laughs> maybe I'll take it. Maybe I'll take it to the road. Maybe. Maybe. I'll maybe. Yeah. maybe. Okay. What, Danit? Danit, yeah. I feel like there was some other questions that came in. Do you want to yes. address? Okay, you want to yeah. address them because I feel like they were so good. Yeah, there was one over here. Where do we draw the line between what to keep private? and spreading awareness when it comes to the mental health of our children. Right. That was a question that came in. Okay. So look, um, privacy is always number one. You can never, God forbid, as a parent for sure not, just in any way breach a confidence that may embarrass your child and, uh, and hurt them. Even if, you're, even if you feel that your child is, is uh, keeping something in and it would be healthy for them to speak, but it's not your job to force it. So what you have to do is encourage them to find someone to speak to that they can trust. So I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a boundary issue as well. You, you know, your child confided in you or, um, or, or you, you know something about your child as a parent, you don't, you know, you, you don't have a right to go talk to anyone about it. Um, what if they gave you permission? One sec, well, let me just, okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Now, the question is a bigger question. Let's say they gave you permission and, and, and they don't mind. I also don't think everything has to be advertised. I think it's case by case. For some people, it's actually healthy for them to express. Remember the mic drop, people get up and they share their story. If it's healing and it's coming, they've talked to their therapist or they talked to their confidant, who someone they trust who says it's good for you, but remember, it can get sensationalistic. People like to hear a secret. You know, it gets a little, it could also be a little inappropriate even. So, and I'm not talking about sneers necessarily. I just mean, it, it's not always a, a uh, it's, it's not always the right thing to do just to let everything hang out. There's also a modest way to share. Let's say a person wants to talk about molestation that they experienced, okay? I, if I, I would coach them, I would say, you don't have to be explicit and say everything. You know, people have an imagination. You can leave some things to the imagination. You want to share that you are extremely deep shame and the big secret. 
talk about that. But always, my, my, my litmus test is always, how will it benefit you and others? It's not just you talk to talk. We don't just get up yeah. to talk. How will it benefit? If it's, let's say, you want to help other people who maybe have been silenced and are afraid, so you're helping build their courage, very commendable. If, for example, you need it, because you need to feel, build courage that you can speak about something that was unspeakable. But you want to be very careful because you don't want it to be misunderstood or misused or abused. And that, so therefore, I think it's a case by case thing. I don't know if there's a, a, a one size fits all, you know, rule. I think the key question is to ask what is the benefit and do it only as much as necessary based on that benefit. It's not, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not an objective of its own to just talk about everything. You know, today you have talk shows, they talk about everything. But I, I look at it more like it's, it's more commercial. It's more entertaining. They, you know, talk about everything becomes a show that everybody wants to listen because it's a tell-all, you know. Right. That's not what we're looking to do here. We're looking to, to heal. We're looking to find. And remember, sometimes it doesn't have to be public. You want to help other people? Why don't you just say, I went through a very, very traumatic experience. And I'm not going to share so much, but if anybody wants to talk to me privately, please call me. That could be mm. equally helpful. You don't have, always have to say it in front of a thousand people. Maybe it should be discreet. And often when I speak in public and, I, and sensitive topics like this come up, someone asks a question, I'll answer briefly and then I'll say, I think we should talk about this afterwards one-on-one. -on -one. Or if a few people want to get together, has to be done with respect and with proper discretion. Remember, Tzniyas is not about hiding things. Tzniyas is about dignity. Mm. You have to always maintain your dignity, even when you're talking about things that are very sensitive or intimate. Right. Oh, love I like that. that. Or dignity. I like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, if, if, if all of us were taught that Tzniyas is dignity instead of covering your elbows and your knees and this and that and, provo and, and not being provocative, Dignity is a whole other story. You're a queen. You're a princess. And for that matter, it's also for men. You know, and, and dignity is also how you take a shower and how you get dressed, even if no one's around. It's not just about provoking others. It's about treating yourself with dignity. That you are, you're a queen. You're, a, you're God's child. You're creating the divine image. You're sacred. And that really ties into what you said in the beginning about parents speaking to their kids after Maidani and exactly. instilling in them, right? Yeah. You talk about the Sneas thing, I'll say many teachers, educators, and parents have demoralized their children. They make them feel like schmatis, like you're worthless. Look how you're dressing like a slut, etc. Oh. What are you doing with that? Even if, it's, even if they are dressing inappropriately, you're basically demoralizing them. Yeah. You're making them feel even worse. What do you think? Uh, you always want to lift people up. In Tanya, the, the Alter Rebbe says something very powerful. He says, anything that demoralizes a person is not coming from Gedusha. It's coming from the Yetzirah. Wow. Any, anything that demoralizes you and doesn't motivate you. He's talking about the difference between depression and sadness. If, on the other hand, it motivates you, you know, you feel, let's say, remorse or regret or sad, but it motivates you. It doesn't paralyze you. It doesn't put, put you into a depression where you, where you freeze up and you lock yourself in your room un, under your blanket, but it motivates you. That's another story. So you have a good, so anything that demoralizes a child or demoralizes an adult for that matter is never coming from a holy place because it's not, what, what is the purpose? Your child comes home from school. Let's say they did something really bad. They hit another child, you know, something inappropriate. So you have parents who my child can never do wrong. It's always someone else's fault. The principal, the teacher, the, 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 this one, that one, the other children, the other parents, you know. Okay. Then their parents the other way around. They're disciplinarians. As soon as they hear something, they ground their child. You can't come out of your room. You can't use technology, whatever. Um, no, no gift, all that stuff. Both of them are not uh, appropriate responses. They're both, frankly, quick fixes. Either you just dismiss the whole thing or you try to just, or you use too much, it's either too much chesed or too much gvura. The right chesedish approach is, and I'm talking about something serious that you've, you've confirmed that they did, not hearsay. 
you confirmed and you know your child needs needs to be, know that's not appropriate so you sit them down in a very kind and loving way not with a tantrum and not with anger very deliberate if you're still angry wait till the next morning or something and say you know let's talk about what happened and make the point it's not the right way to behave and i i and because i love you so much i really feel i feel i feel it's like you're you're me I feel like um, disappointed in myself. And let's talk about what we can do. We can't ignore it because it deserves, maybe you have to tell that person, I'm sorry. And um, you know, you let your child speak. They have, you know, let them give their excuses if necessary. The bottom line, don't demoralize them. Motivate them and say, this is something that needs correction. And I'm thinking, how do we do that? And maybe, yeah, maybe you say, because of that, I feel that, to, 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 to demonstrate the seriousness of this, we're going to do something that you may not like so much, but all in a loving way that doesn't demoralize. You want the child to go away remembering, not that they're just a bad person and did a bad thing, remembering the positive that came out of it. That because of that, why don't you do be extra kind tomorrow in school to a few kids that need a little more compassion or things like that. But this takes more work and more... Uh, more deliberate uh, attention. Intentional parenting. Will this yeah, deliberate them uh, or will this motivate them? That's the question every, all of us should think before we say anything to our kids. Every educator, every parent. Absolutely, absolutely. Uplifting. Danette, Danette, like were, there any more, were there any more questions? Because I think um, what we learned last week was that, um, the live will shut down due to like allowances for how long we can go on. And so it just kind of like shut down and we didn't have like any closing um, statements. So I just want to make sure that we get all our questions in because I think we only have five minutes left. Yeah, I, I, the truth is there were a lot of questions, but everything we spoke about answered the questions. Like, mm. like mm. It, it really was like an all encompassing conversation that really addressed everything literally i'm just looking as, i don't as, think as, as you can imagine i mean i've heard these questions before so so we, right. yeah we, um but yeah look uh, I, how long are you doing this program by the way you're our which pro wait second the, guest. the, the team talk oh this is our you're our second guest second yeah. guest oh yes we just, we just started oh very nice very this nice. is a new project. We've been doing coaching for, it's, it's been, I mean, it's, it's not a new thing, but we're, we're coming out with it now. And we've thought this would be a good platform to number one, raise, raise awareness, open up dialogue, and also bring in experts that know more than we do. So you do this together? You, the plan is to do this together on a weekly basis? Huh? We hope so. That's cool. The plan. Very good. We have a very exciting lineup coming. We have one more one more um, guest next week before Pesach. We take a break for Pesach, and then we come back. We have some, um, you know, we're, we're, we're working on a couple of exciting guests. And if, and if you want to come back, we would love to have we you come back. We would love to have you back. I it just, it's, you know, it, be, coaching, we can only reach so many people. And there's a dire need for, for, for support and information and guidance and the right guidance because there's a lot of wrong guidance out there. So we really want to bring people on that we respect as human. Yeah, sure. Listen, it's, it's, it, it, uh, I think this is vital and, and I commend you for doing this. That's great, great, great. You. And you know, you talk, everyone talks about technology. This is what technology was created for, to use it as a platform. So you talk about uplifting and helping people, not just for entertainment or for nonsense or for wasting time. Right. So great. That's beautiful what you're doing. Yeah, Make sure your children you. are aware of what oh. you're doing. Oh, of course. It's my son like kids earlier. are on the live right now. Yeah. They're, oh. they're, yeah. yeah. They're and, very proud. Yeah. And they should be helped to put. Yeah. They're, they're two beautiful mothers that are becoming superstars. Well, well the, I don't the know about goal, that. goal is not to be a superstar. The goal is really to just get all this, this, this information out there to all there's, you know, we all need it. We all need each other. We're all in this together. I've been getting, and... I've been getting a lot of positive feedback from whether I'm in, you know, in shul or whatever it was and people saying, thank you so much for like, 
putting in the effort to bring in guests that are, it's a very specific thing. It's not just like, oh, you know, Simon Jacobson is coming on Talking Tanya. People can go on to your podcast that I always, I, I listen to your, I follow you on Instagram. So this is something very specific. And we thought that, you know, because you're so respected as a rabbi and as a philosopher, what better topic would we, people want to hear from you about is parenting, especially teenagers today, and especially with the challenges we're facing, that we thought that, you know, you being the second guest, you know, we're, we're setting the standards very, very high for our I know, guests. I don't know what we're thinking. It's like, really, we're starting like right at the top. It's beautiful. You're doing a great job. Thank you. I, I love your questions, your your energy. It's all really great. And uh, thank you so so much. It's, it's so good success. to see you again. It's so it's been so long. I really, 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 I'm grateful that you agreed to come on. And uh, I'm gonna tell Danette about the classes that she missed in um, in high school because I don't I mean I still it. have my I, notes. I mean it. It looks to me like two teenagers, something like 18, 19 years old. <laughs> That's it. We have we have 18, 19 year old kids. I now, have a so. 23 year old, but okay. <laughs> okay, so and well, and my and my eyesight is very good. So, Bar Hashem. Well, Bar Rabbi Hashem. Jacobson, thank you so much for coming on. I learned so much, so much. This was so inspiring, so uplifting, so inspirational. I'm sure everyone else did. Have a wonderful Shabbos. Wonderful Shabbos, and if I don't speak to you, Shabbos Pesach should be very liberating Amen. and very exciting, and uh, and teach your children to really engage and ask the questions and make it come alive Bring in the most powerful games way. Games to the Seder. Amen. Games to the Seder. Absolutely. That's the goal. That's the goal. I thank you so much, Janit, and 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 for reaching out to me and and reconnecting. Yeah. And the what's I say? Absolutely. Thank you so much for how many agreeing. teachers can say they reuniting with their students uh, thirty years later? I don't know. Right. <laughs> very few. Very very few. Very very few. Very, very very few. Very few. Thank you so, so much. We're so grateful to taking your time out of your very busy schedule. So um, really, I, I, I got so many um, um, DMs today, like, how did you get, how did you get Rabbi Jacobson on? And I'm like, Danit, leave it up to Danit. Well, he's just <laughs> such a nice guy. He's a really, he's, I mean, you're really smart and amazing and famous, but you happen to be a really nice person, like a very nice, enjoyable person. You're making so. me blush. Well, <laughs> even rabbis blush. What can we do? Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good Shabbos, and Shabbos. we'll see. We'll see everyone next week. Oh, Rabbi Jacobson, why don't you come next? Why don't you come to the live next week, and maybe we'll bring you on as a as a, a, a another guest, and you could be a mediator or something. We have a surprise guest for next week. Stay in touch. Okay, a, okay. Stay in we touch, and, and and let's see, maybe. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you okay. so so much. Be My well, daughter everybody. just came on. Okay. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.